Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to you. Great to see you on this beautiful morning as we gather together uh, to worship God. A few things for me to mention uh, before we get underway. This morning, we're once again in the book of Judges. We're almost at the end now of this incredible book. Uh, We come to the penultimate chapter this morning. We'll be looking at some verses uh, from Judges 20 uh, this morning. And uh, then our service tonight is at six o'clock as usual. And uh, we have Ben Hagen, who's going to be preaching to us tonight. We look forward to hearing Ben uh, this evening. And that will also be a communion service as well. Tomorrow evening, there is a meeting of presbytery. That's at half past seven. Uh, And then on Wednesday evening is our prayer gathering. That's uh, here, of course, at half past seven. Uh, I'll be speaking at that and continuing our series, looking at the, the threefold office of Christ, who is our prophet, priest, and king. Mums and toddlers, uh, half past ten on Thursday morning, and then the services uh, next week as usual, half past eleven, six o'clock, and also Sunday school at quarter past ten. Let me just mention as well the Presbytery Day Conference. The uh, forms are now available. You'll find them on the desk as you head out. Uh, Once again, we're hosting uh, this day for the denomination Uh, Here uh, in Crumlin, it's going to be on Saturday, the 7th of May. Uh, Warren Peel is going to be coming to to speak at that. Uh, And he's going to be speaking on the theme of Behold the Lamb, looking at uh, how uh, Christ is uh, portrayed for us in the book of Revelation. It'll be a a great day. And uh, I do encourage you to uh, grab those forms, fill them in and return them to me uh, and book your place at that conference. And the other thing to say is a big thank you again to Tim, uh, who's with us this morning. Thank you, Tim, uh, for helping us out on the piano uh, once again. As we begin our time of worship, let's uh, hear uh, these words from Psalm 150 as our call to worship this morning. The psalmist writes, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That is what we're here to do this morning, to praise our God together, first and foremost. And we're going to do so as we turn to our first item of praise, which is Psalm 93. If you could turn there, please, in the hymn book or follow on the screen behind me. The Lord is King, his throne endures, majestic in his height. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength and might. Psalm 93, and we'll stand and sing together.
Please be seated. We turn to God in prayer now, so let's all pray together. Our Father, as we gather to worship you this morning, we do thank you so much for the the words that we've been able to sing from Psalm 93 this morning. This psalm which tells us, the Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, he is put on strength as his belt. Father, we praise you that you are the God who is king over all, the king of majesty, a, a king of great strength and power. And as well as this, we praise you that you are the king who created all things. As the, the psalmist writes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. We praise you that you're the, the God who made all things and you rule forevermore your throne is established from of old and you are from everlasting you are the God who has always been and always will be you are infinite eternal and unchanging and we thank you father for your word to us and as the psalmist proclaims your decrees are very trustworthy We thank you that this morning we can gather before you this king who is exalted above all, this king who stands above all of creation, and we can hear your word, your decrees. As we open the scriptures and hear you speak to us, we thank you that we can rely upon everything that you have said to us, for your word is trustworthy. And you are the God who is holy, holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Father, we acknowledge that you are the God who is perfect and pure. You are set apart from all of creation, and you are set apart from all sin. There is no unrighteousness in you. And Father, as the scriptures clearly show us, that you are the God who will deal with sin. You are a God of justice who will punish every sin that is ever committed. And Father, we are aware that we ourselves are a sinful people. We are those who have turned away from you and broken your commands and gone our own way. And as we acknowledge that before you this morning, we pray that you would forgive us for thinking less of you than we ought. For we think your truth too high, your will too hard, and your power too remote. But they are not... And we pray that even this morning you would resolve our confused minds with your word. That you would redirect our divided wills with your law. Restore our troubled consciences with your forgiveness. Revive our anxious hearts with your presence. Father, we pray for ourselves as your people. And especially those amongst us who are going through seasons of affliction. That in all things, Father, even in perplexing circumstances, that you would be at work for our good and that you would be shaping us and changing us, that we would be those who walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling to which we've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love and eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. May we be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as you in Christ have forgiven us. Father, we pray for the work of the gospel in this place. We pray that as your word is proclaimed week by week, and as we ourselves seek to share your word with those around us, that you would work in the hearts of many to draw them to the Saviour and to include them in your people as they look to Jesus and trust in him. And your purposes are fulfilled, your plans come together, and your people are built up for your glory's sake. And in Jesus' name, we pray all of these things. Amen. The Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 1, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just.
to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, let's sing together once again. Now let's turn to hymn number 99. O Jesus, King most wonderful, our conqueror renowned, O sweetness inexpressible, in whom all joys are found. We'll stand and sing. Please be seated. Let's turn to the scriptures now as we come to Judges chapter 20 this morning. And we'll read some words now from the the start of the chapter. Judges chapter 20. And we read, Then all the people of Israel came out from Dan to Beersheba, including the land of Gilead. And the congregation assembled as one man to the Lord at Mizpah. And the chiefs of all the people of the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 men on foot that drew the sword. Now the people of Benjamin heard that the people of Israel had gone up to Mizpah, And the people of Israel said, Tell us, how did this evil happen? And the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, I came to Gibeah, that belongs to Benjamin, I and my concubine, to spend the night. And the leaders of Gibeah rose against me and surrounded the house against me by night. They meant to kill me, and they violated my concubine, and she is dead. So I took hold of my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, 
for they have committed abomination and outrage in Israel. Behold, you people of Israel, all of you, give your advice and counsel here. And all the people arose as one man, saying, None of us will go to his tent, and none of us will return to his house. But now this is what we will do to Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot, and we will take ten men of a hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, and a hundred of a thousand, and a thousand of ten thousand, to bring provisions for the people, that when they come they may repay Gibeah of Benjamin for all the outrage that they have committed in Israel. So all the men of Israel gathered against the city, united as one man. And the tribes of Israel sent men throughout all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What evil is this that has taken place among you? Now therefore, give up the men, the worthless fellows in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and purge evil from Israel. But the Benjaminites would not listen to the voice of their brothers, the people of Israel. Then the people of Benjamin came together out of the cities to Gibeah to go out to battle against the people of Israel. And the people of Benjamin mustered out of their cities on that day 26,000 men who drew the sword besides the inhabitants of Gibeah who mustered 700 chosen men. Among all these were 700 chosen men who were left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a hare and not miss. The men of Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All these were men of war. The people of Israel arose and went up to Bethel and inquired of God, who shall go up first for us? to fight against the people of Benjamin. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. Then the people of Israel rose in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. The men of Israel went out to fight against Benjamin. And the men of Israel drew up the battle line against them at Gibeah. The people of Benjamin came out of Gibeah and destroyed on that day 22,000 men of the Israelites. But the people, the men of Israel, took courage and again formed the battle line in the same place where they'd formed it on the first day. And the people of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until the evening. And they inquired of the Lord, shall we again draw near to fight against our brothers? the people of Benjamin. And the Lord said, go up against them. So the people of Israel came near against the people of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed 18,000 men of the people of Israel. All these were men who drew the sword. Then all the people of Israel the whole army went up and came to Bethel and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, son of Aaron, ministered before it in those days saying, shall we go out once more to battle against our brothers, the people of Benjamin, or shall we cease? And the Lord said, go up, for tomorrow I will give them into your hand. So Israel set men in ambush around Gibeah, and the people of Israel went up against the people of Benjamin on the third day and set themselves in array against Gibeah as at other times. The people of Benjamin 
went out against the people and were drawn away from the city. And as at other times, they began to strike and kill some of the people in the highways, one of which goes up to Bethel and the other to Gibeah and in the open country, about 30 men of Israel. And the people of Benjamin said, they are routed before us as at the first. But the people of Israel said, let us flee and draw them away from the city to the highways. And all the men of Israel rose up out of their place and set themselves in array at Baal Tamar. And the men of Israel who were in ambush rushed out of their place from Mare Giba. And there came against Gibeah 10,000 chosen men out of all Israel. And the battle was hard, but the Benjamites did not know that disaster was close upon them. And the Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel, and the people of Israel destroyed 25,100 men of Benjamin that day. All these were men who drew the sword. So the people of Benjamin saw that they were defeated. The men of Israel gave ground to Benjamin because they trusted the men in ambush whom they had set against Gibeah. Then the men in ambush hurried and rushed against Gibeah. The men in ambush moved out and struck all the city with the edge of the sword. Now the appointed signal between the men of Israel and the men in the main ambush was that when they made a great cloud of smoke rise up out of the city, then the men of Israel should turn in battle. Now Benjamin had begun to strike and kill about 30 men of Israel. They said, surely they are defeated before us as in the first battle. But when the signal began to rise out of the city in a column of smoke, the Benjaminites looked behind them and behold, the whole of the city went up in smoke to heaven. Then the men of Israel turned and the men of Benjamin were dismayed for they saw that disaster was close upon them. Therefore, they turned their backs before the men of Israel in the direction of the wilderness, but the battle overtook them. And those who came out of the cities were destroying them in their midst. Surrounding the Benjaminites, they pursued them and trod them down from Nohar as far as opposite Gibeah on the east. 18,000 men of Benjamin fell, all of them men of valor. And they turned and fled toward the wilderness, to the rock of Rimon. 5,000 men of them were cut down in the highways. And they were pursued hard to Gidon. And 2,000 men of them were struck down. So all who fell that day of Benjamin were 25,000 men who drew the sword all of them men of valour. But 600 men turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Rimon and remained at the rock of Rimon four months. The men of Israel turned back against the people of Benjamin and struck them with the edge of the sword, the city, men and beasts, and all that they found, and all the towns that they found, they set on fire. Well, this is God's word and we thank him for it and pray for his blessing as we hear his word this morning, both read and preached. I'm going to ask the, the boys and girls if they could come and grab a, a seat on the, the front here. We've not done this for a while, but maybe we'll get back to that now. Boys and girls, if you want to come and sit uh, here at the front and I'll speak to you for a few minutes.
question for you guys. I wonder if any of you could tell me who this is a picture of. So I've got a picture here. Okay, so hands up if you know the answer to this question. Who is this? Right, uh, Elliot, you, you go first. Who is this? Um, Do you remember who it is? Wally, yes, that's right, Wally. Is that what you're going to say, Arthur? Yeah, but well, excellent. So this is Wally. I wonder, do any of you have a Where's Wally book at home? No. No? <laughs> well, I think we do. Ironically, I couldn't find it uh, this morning, so I've got a picture instead. This is, this is Wally. You might see some of the Where's Wally books. I used to love them when I was about your age. And on each page, of the Where's Wally book. It looks a little bit like this, okay? So there's loads and loads of people and lots of things happening. And it's really too much to take all the details in. But what do you have to do when you're reading a Where's Wally book? What do you have to do? Any idea? Miriam? You, you, you have to try and find Wally. That's right. So out of all that's going on and all the different people who are there, there's really one main thing you have to do, and that is simply this, find this one man. Look for this one man who is called Wally. That's what he looks like. You've got to find him on this picture. Now, I had a little look earlier. I didn't manage to find him, but uh, maybe some of you can look at it later and see if you can find Wally on this picture. And each page of the book, if you go through a Where's Wally book, on every page, he's there somewhere. You just have to look and try and find him amongst all the other things that are going on, all the other people that are there. He's looking for this one man who's there on every page. Now, the reason I want to say that is because, in some ways, the Bible is a little bit like a Where's Wally book. I know that sounds like a bit of a strange thing to say, but what I mean is this. When you read the Bible, when you read a chapter, particularly like the one we've just read, which is very long, Lots of things happening, lots of people, hours and hours of people mentioned. How do you read a, a, a book like that? How do you read a chapter of the Bible like that? Well, here's what you do. You read it looking for one man in particular. And actually, he's on every page in the Bible. If you look carefully enough, you find this one man. The one man you're looking for is the, the saviour, the rescuer of God's people. Now, who's the rescuer? God has given to us. Elliot. Um, Jesus. Absolutely right. Like yes. I need to have a picture together. Yes, you got a picture together. Yes, I know. I was in trouble last week for not picking up it, so we were going easily with it. So, yes, the one man who God has said will rescue us is his son, Jesus. And he's on every page of the Bible. You just have to look carefully and see how is God telling us about Jesus here. And you know, in some ways, the Bible is, is easier than a Where's Wally book. Because in a Where's Wally book, you've got no clues. But actually, God gives us clues all along in the story of the Bible about where we can find this one man that we're looking for. And so he, he tells us right at the start of the Bible, this one man is going to have a, a great battle against the devil. And he's going to be wounded in that battle, but he's going to defeat the devil. He's going to crush head of the serpent. And then a few pages later on, God says, this one man you're looking for, he's going to come from the family of Abraham. He's going to belong to that family. But then a few pages later on, we find out God says he, he's going to come from the tribe of Judah. He's going to be a king from the tribe of Judah. And then you keep going down a few more pages, and God says to us, He's not just going to be from Abraham's family and from the tribe of Judah, but he's going to belong to the house of David. And then you keep going a few more pages, and God gives another clue. He says, this, this man is going to be born in a town called Bethlehem. And again and again and again, hundreds of times, God gives us these clues so that when we're reading the Bible and reading about all these people and all these things that are going on, actually there's one person we're looking for. He's the rescuer who God has sent to us. He's promised that he would send to us. And there's a great line in, in John's Gospel, John chapter 1 verse 41. A man called Andrew uh, has met Jesus and he goes to his brother 
and who is called Simon, and he said to him, he found him. He found him. He found the Messiah, the promised rescue. He's the one that we've been looking for all throughout the story of the Bible. And at last he found him. So let me encourage you, whether you're reading your Bible at home, and perhaps you're reading a bit like this morning, it's, it's not too easy. And there's lots of people, there's all sorts of things going on. Remember, you're reading the Bible looking for one man, the rescuer, the saving God promised. And he's who he is. And so trust in him. Well, let me say a, a short prayer. Now let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that you've given us the best book of all. You've given us your word, the Bible. And even though there's lots of people in the Bible, and lots of things going on in the Bible, Ultimately, it's all about one man. It's all about Jesus. And as we read the Bible carefully and look carefully, he's there on every page. And so help us as we read our Bibles at church and at home, um, with parents and at Sunday school. Help us always be reading the Bible, thinking this. How can I find Jesus here? What is this bit of the Bible telling me about Jesus? And as well as this, Help us to not just learn about Jesus, but come to trust in him for ourselves, so that he is the rescuer for us as well. Father, all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Boys and girls, you can head back to your seats now. We're going to sing uh, once again. It's number 64 in the hymn book. We'll stand and sing. be seated and let's pray together father we thank you for your word thank you that it is ultimately and chiefly and supremely about your son jesus the savior that you have given to us and we pray now that as we turn to the scriptures that by the help of your spirit for both preacher and hearer our eyes will be opened to see jesus and to trust in him and obey him in all things. 
So we look to you for help now, Father. Send your spirit and build up your people for your glory's sake. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, please do have your Bible open there at Judges chapter 20, the longest and also the bloodiest chapter in the book of Judges. And the, the background to this story, as you know, is the, the tragic events that took place in chapter 19, a story of God's people descending in moral decline, descending into marital mess, a lack of love for one another, and then worst of all, gross sexual sin amongst the people of God. A woman was raped repeatedly by a gang of men in the city of Gibeah of the tribe of Benjamin. She subsequently died as a result of that awful ordeal. And then somewhat strangely, her husband took her body, uh, divided it into 12 pieces, and sent it around the tribes of Israel so that everyone in Israel would know of this awful crime that Gibeah of Benjamin had committed. And chapter 19 ended with the people of Israel considering, what do we do about this? Let's look at the, the closing words of chapter 19 for a moment. The people say, consider it, take counsel and speak. And you see that they're, they're saying, what are we going to do about this awful sin that has happened amongst God's people? Well, chapter 20 is where we find out what they do. And to make a, a long story very short, uh, the other 11 tribes gather together an army of 400,000 men. They go up against the tribe of Benjamin, who themselves raise an army of 26,000 men. They end up engaging in three gruesome, costly battles. Surprisingly, Benjamin wins the first two battles. And then at the third battle, eventually Israel wins and Benjamin is decimated. In total, over 65,000 Israelite soldiers are killed in the course of this one chapter. The question is, of course, well, what do we make of this story? What is God doing in Judges 20? What is God teaching us here? I want, to, I want us to notice that there's a number of things that God is teaching us here. And the first one is this. The Lord will deal with sin. The Lord will deal with sin. Now this is a very bloody and messy chapter. And as we look at the story of this chapter, maybe you think to yourself, well, what on earth is going on here? Why did God put a chapter like this in the Bible? Is he present here at all? Or is this a story of God's people just doing their own thing? Well, the writer of the, the book of Judges tells us very clearly, God is present in the story of this chapter. And he shows us clearly what God is doing here. And so notice what the writer tells us at the start of verse 35. It's after Israel has finally won the battle against Benjamin. He writes, And the Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel. The Lord defeated them. And there you have it. That is the theological interpretation of the events of this chapter. This crushing defeat of the tribe of Benjamin was in fact the Lord's doing. The Lord knew all about the sin that we read about last week in chapter 19, those awful events. And God cannot and God will not turn a blind eye to sin. He is a God of perfect justice. 
And so every sin that he's ever committed will be punished by God. And that is what this chapter is showing us first and foremost. The Lord will deal with sin. Now firstly, that should comfort us, shouldn't it? This is good news for us. When we look around ourselves at the world in which we live, and we see all sorts of sins taking place in the world, even sins like chapter 19 described, Chapter 20 is then there to assure us God knows about all of these things. He sees the sins that are committed on the earth. And because he is a God of perfect justice, he will not just turn a blind eye to those sins. He will not just brush it under the carpet. No, he will deal with sin sooner or later. In the end, justice will be done. Every sin in the world will be punished. And in a world where things like Judges 19 happen, it is comforting for us to know that the Lord will deal with sin. There will be a day of judgment where justice will be done and will be seen to be done. And so as the Apostle Paul puts it, God has fixed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The Lord will deal with sin by Jesus Christ. And that should comfort us in a world where there are sins like Judges 19. But also, of course, it should challenge us as well. Because if this chapter is showing us, as we've seen, that the Lord will deal with sin, then that implies, doesn't it, he will deal with my sin and he will deal with your sin as well. Every sin will be punished by God. And so this chapter ought to drive us to Jesus, make us cling to him for forgiveness for our sins. As Christians, we know that all of our sins were carried by Jesus to the cross. And there the God-man, Jesus Christ, suffered the penalty that was due to us for our sin. At the cross, God dealt with our sin according to his perfect justice. And therefore, if you're someone who is trusting in Jesus for forgiveness... You have the assurance that there is therefore now no condemnation for you. Your sins are paid for. Your punishment has already happened at the cross. Your guilt is atoned for. You're forgiven. God has already dealt with all of your sin once and for all at the cross. And so as we look at this chapter, the main thing we learn is very, very simply this. The Lord will deal with sin. He's a God of justice. He will punish every sin. And let me ask you, what have you done therefore about your sin? And have you come to Jesus? Have you trusted in him so that you can receive free, full and forever forgiveness from God? The Lord will deal with sin. And then here's the, the second thing that we see in the chapter, and it is a tragic thing that we see here, and it is that sometimes God's people would rather fight against one another than against sin. Sometimes God's people would rather fight against one another than against sin. And so the, the people of Israel have, have gathered their army, 400,000 men, and they come up against the tribe of Benjamin, and then look what happens in, in verses 12 and 13. The tribes of Israel send their men to the tribe of Benjamin saying, what evil is this that has taken place among you? Now therefore, give up the men, the worthless fellows in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and purge evil from Israel. This awful crime has taken place in the city of Gibeah. 
And so the people of Israel rightly speak to the leaders of the various tribes, uh, the leaders of the various towns amongst the tribe of Benjamin. And they say to them, you know what has happened. You know that certain people from amongst your tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, have committed these gross sins. And therefore we must deal with this sin that is amongst the people of God. And as God has commanded us, we must purge this evil from amongst Israel. And so arrest those guilty men, hand them over, and let them be punished. Now Israel was acting rightly in this. They were taking sin seriously. They were seeking to act in line with God's law, the law of the God who deals with sin. And yet we read, the Benjaminites would not listen to the voice of their brothers, the people of Israel. So the tribe of Benjamin said, no, we're not going to do that. These are our own people. You've got to stick up for your own. We're not going to hand them over to you, despite what they've done. No, actually, we're going to defend them. And so the tribe of Benjamin raises their own army, 26,000 men. Now they're, they're massively over, outnumbered, aren't they? Against 400,000 men. But they're stubborn. They refuse to accept that their tribe is in the wrong. They refuse to deal with that sin that's amongst them. And instead, they decide that they will fight against Israel. And it's a tragic thing, isn't it? On three occasions, notice, verses 13, 23, and 28, we're told that Israel and Benjamin were brothers. They're all part of the same family, the people of God. And they should have been fighting alongside one another against sin, the sin that's within and also the enemies from without as well. But the tribe of Benjamin would rather fight against their own brothers than fight against sin. And it is always a tragic thing when God's people would rather fight one another than against sin. Now, of course, Judges 20 is a, an extreme example, isn't it? But the, the principle I hope you see applies to us as well. When it comes to my sin, when for some reason my sin has come to the surface, am I just a, a little bit like the tribe of Benjamin here? Do I dig my heels in, become stubborn about my sin, refuse to give it up, make excuses for it? Do I defend my own sin? And then to make matters worse, lash out at others, even those who are brothers and sisters in Christ. Am I quick to criticise others, fight against them, even whilst giving a free pass to my own sin? Jesus says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or in contrast to that, when confronted about my sin, do I acknowledge it, confess it, seek God's forgiveness, and then with God's help seek to root that sin out and put it to death? Here you see that the challenge that these verses are putting before us, would I rather fight against God's people or against my own sin? Now, of course, the enemy loves to try and get God's people fighting against one another, falling out with one another, at loggerheads with one another. Satan loves to try and split the church. And so Paul warns us, do not let the sun go down in your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Don't fall into the, the trap that the tribe of Benjamin fell into here, defending your sin whilst fighting against your brothers. No, instead, fight against sin, root it out like Benjamin ought to have done, and put it to death. And you see, the tragedy that is at the heart of this chapter is that sometimes God's people would rather fight against one another 
and then fight against sin. And then here's the, the third thing we learn from this chapter, and that is that the Lord's word is clear, but his ways are not. The Lord's word is clear, but his ways are not. Now here's the, the biggest puzzle in the chapter. The people of Israel have assembled their army, 400,000 men. The Benjaminites have assembled their army, 26,000 men. Things are getting tense. They're heading towards a civil war. And the people of Israel do the right thing here. They seek the Lord's guidance. Verse 18, they, they inquire of God. Who shall go up first for us to fight against the people of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go first. And you see, God gives them this clear word of instruction. The tribe of Judah must take the lead in this battle against Benjamin. So the tribe of Judah goes up against Benjamin and surprisingly they suffer a terrible defeat. They lose 22,000 men in the battle. That seems odd, doesn't it? God had clearly said to them in his word, go and do battle against Benjamin. Send Judah first. And yet they lost. And then exactly the same thing happens again. The people of Israel go back to God and they say to him, Lord, do you want us to continue fighting against Benjamin? And God's word comes back clear a second time. God says, yes, go and attack Benjamin for a second time. And so they do that. And again, they suffer a terrible defeat. This time, they lose 18,000 men. So already after the first two battles, the Israelite army has lost 40,000 men, 40,000 soldiers killed in battle. And so they go back to God a third time. And for a third time, they seek God's word. Do you want us to go to battle against Benjamin? And this time, the Lord says, go up, for tomorrow I will give them into your hand. So this time, God promises, yes, go and fight Benjamin, but this time you will defeat him. And so it happens. The rest of the chapter describes in detail how this military victory was gained through some clever tactics, a ruse, an ambush. The tribe of Benjamin was thoroughly defeated at the third attempt. Over 25,000 Benjaminite soldiers were killed in the third battle. Now remember, they only started with 26,000. So the army of Benjamin is pretty much wiped out. Just a few escape elsewhere, we're told. And yet it has to be said, doesn't it, the whole thing is so perplexing. Why did it take Israel three attempts to win this battle against just one tribe, the tribe of Benjamin? And more to the point, why on earth, why on earth did God send them into battle those first two times, only for them to suffer defeat? It's very strange, isn't it? And the point that we can take from this is as follows. The Lord's word is clear, but his ways are not. His word is clear, but his ways are not. And it is what the Christian life is like, isn't it, when you think about it? That on the one hand, God's word is clear. There's even a theological term for that, for those of you who like theological terms. It is called the perspicuity of Scripture. What that means very simply is God's word is clear. It's not hard to pick up a Bible and, and read it and see what God has to say to you. What he wants you to believe about him. What he wants you to do in terms of obedience to him. It's not difficult to read the Bible on, on that level, is it? The Bible is clear. God's word is clear. Just as God's word was clear to the people of Israel in Judges 20... When three times he told them, go and fight battles against Benjamin. God's word is clear. But God's ways, his ways are far from clear. Paul says, doesn't he, how inscrutable his ways. That there is a mystery to the providence of God that is beyond our searching out. 
And if you're a Christian, then you're familiar with living with that tension, aren't you, in the Christian life? God's word is clear, but his ways are not. You know what God has said. You, you pick up the Bible, you read it. You know what it means to believe in God and obey him. And then you try and live that out in your Christian life, and you find that that, that path of faith and obedience is just beset with difficulties, opposition, setbacks, perplexing circumstances. And you can't make head nor tail of it. You don't know what's going on. Things just don't work out as you'd expected them to work out. And it must have been exactly how the people of Israel felt here after the, the first two, de two defeats. What on earth is going on? God's word is clear, but his ways are not. Now, having said that, I think we are given a bit of a clue here as to what God is doing through this strange providence. Now, notice this. Right at the start of the chapter, we're told the people of Israel assembled as one man to the Lord. That's a good sign. God's people are drawing near to their God. Then in verse 18, before the first battle, they inquire of God. They're seeking his word. They want some guidance about what to do, and they receive it. But then after the first defeat, but before the second battle, they come to God again, and they seek his word again, but this time they come with, with greater earnestness. This time we read, they went up and wept before the Lord until evening, and they inquired of the Lord. And you see, their seeking of the Lord and his word has become more wholehearted, it seems. And then after the second defeat and before the third battle, they, they come to God again. And this time, it's, it, there's an even deeper, even more heartfelt seeking of God. We read that then all the people of Israel, the whole army, went up and came to Bethel and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the people of Israel inquired of the Lord. Do you see what's happening to them? They're, they're living with this strange tension whereby God's word is clear but his ways are not. And because of that very tension, they are gradually drawn into this deeper and deeper pursuit of God. And by his strange providence, God is, God is at work in their lives. He's drawing his people into a closer walk with him. I wonder, are you, are you living in that, that tension at the moment whereby you know that God's word is clear, but his ways are not clear to you? You, you don't know what is going on in life. You, you know how to obey God because his word is clear, but you cannot for the life of you figure out what God is doing in the circumstances in which you currently find yourself. Why has this happened? Where is God leading me? His word's clear, but it, his ways are not. And you see, amidst all of that tension, that there is something else that is happening as a result, that God is actually at work in your heart, he's drawing you into a closer walk with him as you pursue him more deeply, as you cry out to him in prayer, as you keep going back to him again and again and again like Israel did, seeking his work, calling on him to make the way forward clear. In this way, we, we see the wisdom of God, don't we? His word is clear to us, but his ways are not. And yet even in that, he draws us closer to him. And then finally, and just very, very briefly, there's one more thing to mention from this chapter. And that is, where do we find a king? Where do we find a king? Now, if you've been with us over the, the past few weeks, you'll know that there's a certain refrain that, that keeps on appearing in various forms in the, the final chapters of this book. 
The writer keeps telling us that in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And the point is, the writer is saying to us repeatedly, if God's people are going to be saved from their enemies, turn from sin and be transformed into the people God wants them to be, they need a king and they need the right king. They need a righteous, godly king to lead them. Now, you may have noticed that that refrain does not appear in chapter 20. But the idea, the idea of them needing a king has not disappeared from the narrative. The question here is, where do they find such a king for God's people? And having listened to the the story of this chapter, what is the last tribe that you would go to? out of all of Israel? What is the last tribe that you would go to to try and find a godly king? Obviously the last tribe to go to is Benjamin. This tribe who had committed these atrocious sins in chapter 19 and then here in chapter 20 refused to deal with that sin and instead fought against God's people. And the point is, don't look for a godly king from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, in reality, where did Israel turn, first of all, to find a king for themselves? They turned to the tribe of Benjamin. Saul, the son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, you couldn't make it up, could you? It is the last place that they ought to go to to find a king, and yet it is the first tribe they went to for a king. And, of course, it was a disaster. God is saying to his people through Judges 20, don't don't go to Benjamin looking for a godly king. Where then should you go to find a godly king for God's people? Now God has dropped a hint into Judges chapter 24. Let's look at verse 18 again. The people of Israel arose and went up to Bethel and inquired of God, who shall go up first for us to fight against the people of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah, should go up first. Now you see, don't you, God's choice to stand at the head of his people and to lead his people in the battle against sin is the tribe of Judah. And that's not just incidental. It it should remind us of something else in the book of Judges. It should remind us of the very first line in the book, which we looked at, it must have been months ago now, But exactly the same thing happens in the very first line of the book. Remember this. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up first. And you see what God is hinting at? It's as if he's saying, people of God, do you want to know where to find the king that you need? The one who will stand at the head of Israel. The one who will lead you in the battle against the enemy. The one who will drive out sin. Don't bother looking for a king from the tribe of Benjamin. You won't find him there. I have chosen Judah. Look for a king who is from the tribe of Judah. Look for one who is the king of the Jews. And that should have not been a surprise for God's people because God had already said this earlier on in the Bible. Genesis 49, we have this prophecy that the great king for God's people would come out of the tribe of Judah. You remember the the prophecy of Jacob in Genesis 49. He says, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Here's the the question that arises out of Judges chapter 24. Where do you find the king that God's people need? And the story of this chapter tells us, don't look for one in Benjamin, Saul is not the answer to your problems. 
Now look for a king who is from the tribe of Judah. Look to the one who is born king of the Jews. Look to Jesus. He is your king. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we reflect on the the teaching of this chapter, we come to you thanking you and praising you that you are a God who is holy and righteous and just, a God who will not turn a blind eye to sin. And living in a world where we see all around us sin running free, we thank you that one day you will deal with all sin. You've fixed a day when you will judge the world in righteousness by the man you have appointed. And of this you've given proof by raising him from the dead. And therefore, may we all come to the Saviour now, turning from our sin, trusting in him for forgiveness, thanks to the fact that our sin has been dealt with at the cross when Jesus died for us there. Father, we pray that we would not fall into the trap that the tribe of Benjamin fell into in this chapter. Help us not to be those who fight against our own brothers and sisters in Christ. And instead, may we fight against sin with the strength that you've given us. Help us to root out sin and put it to death. Father, we've also considered this morning the the mystery of your providence. The fact that your word is clear and yet your ways are not. And oftentimes we are perplexed. Perhaps some of us are perplexed at why you've placed us in our current circumstances. And yet we pray that whatever we are facing, that you would draw us into a closer walk with you. And Father, we pray that you would keep our eyes fixed on the king that you have chosen, the king that you have given to us. May our eyes be fixed on Jesus, the one who was born king of the Jews, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king that you have given to us. And in his name we pray all of these things. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 256, this great king that we've been hearing about this morning. Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Hail in the time appointed, his reign on earth begun. Hymn 256, stand and sing.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.